super excited and, and really pleased to be able to premiere this, this film. Um, it's exceeded our expectations, and I want to kind of set that up for the audience. Um, the film is called the, Conne the 29th Connecticut, and it tells the story of the 29th Connecticut Colored Infantry. Actually, the flag for the regiment is a replica up on the back wall that you guys can see as well. This is actually the, the soldiers uh, were cr carrying this, and this flag actually represented the, the regiment itself. Um, so the, the short film is an original documentary that tells the story of 11 brave African-American men from Berlin who enlisted in the Connecticut's 29th and 30th Colored Troop Regiment and fought for the freedom of their people in the, in the nation. Discover their remarkable story of sacrifice and heroism on the battlefield. I uh, want to make sure that the town knows about that. This is important black history. It's important American history. And it's also important to recognize the fact that these men were responsible for the Juneteenth holiday. So Berlin has an actual direct historical tie to this particular national holiday today. What questions do you have? Yeah, nobody? Nobody has questions? Yes, Tracy. That's more research that we need to do. Actually, our partners from the Historical Society are behind you. Um, so that is actually one thing that we would want to research going forward. We do not know a whole lot about them, although we do know a few things. And actually, I brought some friends along as well. So um, I don't know, Kathleen, if you can come up. Um, one of the pr people that we know about um, is actually um, Sergeant William Morrison, who's actually born in New Milford, Connecticut. We do know about his life. Um, he grew up in New Milford, um, and we'll have Kathy tell you a little, little bit more about what, what we know about him. Um, we do know about um, at least the, the three who, who died as well. One of them is buried in the battlefield in Virginia, um, and that's um, Mr. Smith, and then also Corporal Sidney um, was um, killed in battle as well. We do know that he's from the Syracuse area originally, and that his wife filed for it and has her, his pension um, in the Syracuse area. The other gentleman we don't know as much about, and that's continued research. Um, one of the things that we'd like to do is continue this project and grow it and make it actually a, a full-fledged film. So if you guys go to our website, we'd love to have some donations to help us be able to uh, to make it a, a full-fledged film as well. But again, we want to thank our, our partners, the um, Community Foundation of Great, Great New Britain, the y, YWC of New Britain as well, our, um, the great library partners that we have here, as well as the Berlin Historical Society, who all helped us in pulling this thing, this thing together. Yes? Were these um, white soldiers or black soldiers together? Th this was a black regiment, oh, although yeah. they were commanded by white officers. Yeah, because in the movie, the bit before, it, you know, when the wife is about, it's about the same thing. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah, the, it, it, it's, it's similar. Yeah, Connecticut had its own regiment as well. Yes. Do we know if any of their descendants still live in this area? We do not, but that is actually one thing that we, we do want to research. So again, we're, we're hoping that we'll have an opportunity in, in the future to be able to research and be able to contact their families. We'd love to be able to, to show, the, show this film to them and find them. Go ahead. Well, I just wanted to mention that the 29th had an almost unprecedented enlistment rate of 78%. Mm. It was huge. Fought fiercely, enthusiastically enlisted and fought fiercely. Kathy, do you want to come up? Or what? <laughs> to, to talk, I mean, you can talk about, you know, um, Sergeant Morrison, and, and you, I just was able to attend a, um, a session that Kathy did as well at the um, Shelton Trumbull, sorry, Trumbull Library a, a couple of days ago, and she did a great presentation. And there, obviously, there were multiple. There were sixteen hundred. Um, people from Connecticut who enlisted in the 29th Regiment. They were from around the state, including from New Milford, and Kathleen has a, a little bit more information to share about um, the research that she's done from New Milford specifically. Again, one of our soldiers was born in New Milford. I was wondering where William Webb was today. Or was, was he, I know he wasn't from um, Berlin, but I think I've seen him in the uh, yeah, film. The, the film was really focused on Berlin soldiers specifically, but he did actually come and present to our historical society in April. Mm -hmm. I thought I saw him on your website. Yeah, yeah. yeah and um, William Morrison, um, 
was born in New York, but as far as I know, and um, he uh, he had four older siblings, and they all died before he was three years old. So then to have the remaining, the surviving son, give his life at the end, and his parents were alive, and his father died a couple of years after. And we supposedly buried at Center Cemetery, but all I see is a stone flat on the ground next to his parents. So um, I think people should know that <laughs> what this what this man did and get that stone up. It'd be cool. Yeah. How were the soldiers from Berlin? How did they get from Berlin, Connecticut to Richmond? I'll take that one. They they enlisted and they um, mustered into, the, which means that they um, started in the army and they all went to New Haven, and they were they were kind of all pulled together as a regiment in New Haven. They went on a steamship from New Haven. They went to South Carolina for additional training, and then from from South Carolina they went into battle into Virginia. And Frederick Douglass saw them off before they. Other questions? Yes? Is this going to be available to take out at the library this spring? That's a good question. It's actually up on the, our, our Berlin Equity Action Team website. Um, you can go there now and go, go and see the film, but we actually we, we can work with the library in order to make it available for the public. Okay. And you think you have it making it bigger? Yes, we, yeah, we, we, we definitely would love to be able to make it bigger. We'd like to be able to make it a 30 to 45 minute film. Um, we are super honored and very pleased that the Wide Awakes Film Company um, helped us develop this film. They're actually a historical film company out of Kansas City, Missouri. Um, if any of you have heard of the streaming service called Curiosity Stream, um, it's, a, it's really focused on historical education and science programs. It's about three or four dollars a month to, to uh, subscribe to it, but they have a number of films on there. They have one about the Wide Awakes Movement. Actually, there's a, a, a poster here in the back that talks about the Wide Awakes Movement. Actually, there was a club here in Berlin as well, um, and really was fa found them kind of doing some research about the Wide Awakes, but they do excellent work, and again, we're very pleased with the work that they were able to do for this film. Yes? That's a good question. We need to get in touch with the school system to, to find out. But I think that this would be great to, you know, be in the school system to teach, um, you know, Berlin um, students about the Civil War and, and on our role in it. We we haven't as of yet. We we have just um, literally this week applied to have our film shown at the Mystic. Um, film festival. We don't know if we're going to be accepted or not. So hopefully, if we are accepted, we we will spread the word, and, and hopefully our film will will be viewed there as well. But outside of that, we need to work on our arranging time to be able to show it McGraw in town. But we'd love to do so. Yes. I, I just had a request. I would love to see more um, of this information being carried over into our school system. But I, I just my personal opinion. I would hope not during Black History Month because. <laughs> I swear we have kids growing up thinking black history is like a separate little side chunk of our country and our history and our reality today and who we are. And I really would like to see more and more of this awareness, like all other history, treated like all our history, um, a focus to catch up on what's been missing for generations of awareness, but important, it's our history as a country. and. So that, that's just my own way. Yeah, we, we agree 100%. I, I, again, I, hopefully that you know this, this film can be used to help educate Brown students about the Civil War in general. This was a piece of American history. This actually happened. These men actually fought and died, and they, they were from this town. And they were so, all of them, yeah. Yeah, and I, and I think it's important that the town, again, really understand that this is Brown history, and that it's, it's important for you guys to be able to see it and understand the context of what's happened. Yes. Do you know if there were any black women that were involved in the operation? <laughs> 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 she, she gives information about that, so that's why I ended up. Yeah. 
Yeah, I had to share that. Um, there was actually a song written about the 29th, and in it, um, the state, our first official state troubadour said there was, and a woman man was, was dressed as a soldier. And then I found this letter um, written by a member of Company F of the 29th Regiment, and he said, did you ever hear about a man having a baby? <laughs> and um, I guess she must have kept it a good secret because all next thing he says is, she's in the hospital, it rained, and um, that was it. I don't know what her name was. I don't know if there are more women that did this, but um, that's, <laughs> thank you for asking that question because we know at least one woman said that. right along in our presentation today. Um, so we have Christina with us, and she is from the Connecticut Historical Society, and she is going to um, talk to us about Harlem Renaissance writer Anne Petrie, who you may know is from Old Saybrook. She carefully preserved artifact, artifacts chronicling black, the black community of Saybrook. We're gonna look at some daguerreotypes by Augustus Washington, who abandoned a successful Hartford photography business to build a new nation in Africa. And we're gonna browse through the photo album of a Hollywood actress who became a champion of labor rights for black entertainers. Welcome, Christina. So this presentation is going to be a little bit more broad and less deep dive into all of your local history, but there should be some things that connect, if not to you know, your exact town of Berlin here, um, our state of Connecticut. Um, and so it's nice that hopefully we'll kind of complement some of the deeper dives that you have been hearing today. That was a you know, fascinating documentary we just saw, and I know there's a very small connection to the 29th Regiment in this presentation as well. Um, so we at the Connecticut Historical Society in Hartford collect objects which include furniture, tools, manuscripts, letters, clothing, all sorts of things fall into that object category from different towns and cities throughout the state of Connecticut. So that does mean, you know, that there might be some um, people, some events that we only have, you know, a couple objects on. There are some collections that are a little bit deeper. So I just want to point out that this, of course, is not meant to be a comprehensive, you know, presentation on anything. This is a huge topic. Connecticut might not be a huge state, but there is a lot of history here. There are a lot of people who have accomplished great things here. So this is meant to kind of just be that overview, right? Getting us thinking about some of our connections. Um, and I hope to leave some time at the end um, for people to share if you have some of those more, you know, local Berlin connections to make some of that history. Definitely feel free to share that with me. So we're going to dive right into it, going relatively chronologically. Um, and, you know, this will tell us not just about some of the famous people of Connecticut, some of the events concerning, you know, social, political kind of events and happenings, but also give us a little insight into museum collecting policies, right? Our historical society has been around since 1825, and as you can imagine, the things that our you know, initial staff members were collecting almost 200 years ago aren't necessarily all the same things that we want to continue collecting, think are important today. Um, it also is you know, going to tell us about what was kept at certain time periods. So if we're going back to colonial Connecticut, you know, a lot of the information that we can find on people of color in this state do tie into kind of legal documents, right? Whether it's a bill of sale like this one, reminding us that Connecticut did in fact have slavery here for quite a length of time, um, or whether it is, you know, actual laws. Um, Connecticut did have a set of black codes set into place that we applied not just to any African Americans, but also native individuals, any person of color living in the state. So all of that, of course, was going to affect the experiences of anyone living in early Connecticut. It also reminds us that, you know, especially early on, a lot of the documentation that we have was written by or about or for the people who were in power. So during the colonial period in Connecticut, that is typically, you know, wealthier white men. And so it's one reason why we have, you know, and this is just kind of a litany of some of the types of documentation we have concerning slavery in this state. 
It will show us that, you know, enslavers were both white, male, and females. It will show us that the enslaved were of all different ages, all different backgrounds. And you can see that, you know, um, families were often separated when you see the ages of some of these children. I do also want to kind of zoom in on this last one here, because the wording of this particular document, upon completion of 20 years of service, he is to be given his freedom if consistent with the laws of Connecticut. So Connecticut is one of those states that does introduce a period of gradual emancipation. In 1784, just a couple years after this document was written, um, this act is passed stating that any person born into slavery past that point would be granted their freedom upon reaching the age of 25. At first glance, you know, sometimes people say, oh, 1784, right, that's early on, that's great, they're making, you know, strides to end slavery. Connecticut does not fully abolish this practice, though, until 1848. So this gradual process was very, very gradual. Many, many children were still being born into slavery, and anyone who was enslaved before that date, that act did not apply to them, and they might live their life out in that enslaved state. So again, just something to keep in mind, right? Like every state in our country, there were different policies, kind of different laws concerning slavery, but Connecticut's lasted for quite some long time, because 1848 is, you know, not that far off, right, from the Emancipation Proclamation, the 13th Amendment, and all of that. So moving on to kind of objects, right? Things created by individuals, which are a staple, of course, of history museums. You see on the screen here a powder horn that was carved by an artist named John Bush. Um, now John Bush, you know, wasn't an artist to start off his career. He was actually a military man. So he grew up in Boylston, Massachusetts, spent quite a bit of time in Connecticut, um, and joined the local militia. Um, he served actually in Connecticut, New York, and Massachusetts at different points in his life. He did work his way up to become a military clerk, uh, meaning that he gained himself a higher salary, had a lot of administrative responsibilities in addition to fighting. Um, but like many soldiers, he also has you know, a fair amount of time to kill as he's you know, marching from place to place, as he's in camp. And so he takes up this skill of powder horn carving. Now most soldiers at this point, right, so colonial New England into early America, would have needed to carve something into their powder horns just to distinguish it from their fellow soldiers. So your initials, maybe a quick design. But as we can see from this one here, right, John Bush is taking that a step further. He is more artistically inclined, so he's you know, making his powder horn into a work of art. And other people see that, and he starts selling other powder horns. He gets commissions you know, from other people in his regiment, and then eventually outside his regiment. So today, art historians look to John Bush's work as um, kind of a staple and a uh, exemplary, I guess, example of the Lake George School of Powder Horn Carving. Please don't ask me details about that particular tradition. I know next to nothing about powder horn carving. But suffice to say, right, he is a master of this craft, and many artists who come after him are basing their designs off John Bush's. The, one of the main reasons why I'm showing you this is not just because it's a cool object we have in our collection, um, but because you know this sort of piece is not signed in the same way that like fine art is, right? When you go to an art museum, we get signatures on things like paintings and sculptures. And yet in history museums, there are all these sorts of things that are, yes, very, you know, artistic, very masterful, but are also very practical. This had, you know, a job. The tool here was to hold, you know, gunpowder. And so if we think of all the things that turn up in history museums, historic houses, um, think furniture, right? Think any tools, um, especially if we're going way back, right, to tend to the fire. Pokers, you know, those big metal pots, any textiles, clothing, blankets, um, curtains, all of that had to be created by someone, and yet they're not always given kind of credit, right? They're not acknowledged in the same way. And so while we know that a black artist carved this particular piece, there are a lot of you know, pieces in museums that we don't know anything about the creator. And so it's very likely that we're experiencing you know, the craftsmanship of a lot more black people than are being credited in museums. Because think of all the black people that were present in early Connecticut who would have been you know, either tradesmen by craft um, or perhaps even enslaved and put to task you know, making all of these very practical, very useful things. Um, so something to keep in mind as we're you know, making our ways through museums and something that I think a lot of museums are working to try to shed more light on and track down some of those creators.
There's also the side of things, you know, throughout history of people in power working pretty actively to try to suppress traditions, right? So that's another reason why sometimes it's a little more difficult to track down things made or written about um, any minority group in history museums. That doesn't mean, of course, that it's not present, and we see that a lot of, you know, action was taken to kind of, um, I guess, defeat any efforts to suppress culture, tradition, knowledge. And one really great example of that in not only Connecticut, but other New England states is this tradition of the black governor. Um, so this was a man who was elected by his peers. Um, in Connecticut, the black governor wouldn't have been for the entire state, but for smaller communities. So at any given time between like the 1750s, almost to the 1850s, um, cities and towns like Hartford, Norwich, uh, New Haven, New London, Seymour, Durham, Derby, and many more that I'm probably forgetting, would have elected a black governor. So again, this is a man elected by his peers, so someone who you know held a lot of sway in his community, who was highly respected, and was seen as a leader, because his basic job was to act as sort of a liaison between the black and white populations of that area. He was the person you know anyone would go to if they were having troubles, right, having concerns. This man could be free or enslaved, so it's really kind of interesting that legal status did not come into play here, right? That it truly was whoever was best suited for that job as seen by you know, the other members of the community. The election of a black governor in Connecticut was linked to all sorts of celebrations. So I mentioned very briefly black codes before. These were laws that were put into place that would limit you know, the number of people of color who could gather in any given place. So you know, gatherings of more than like three black people at once would be um, illegal in many places. Um, it restricted travel, you know, people had to carry documents to go even within the same state. And yet all of that was kind of pushed aside for these celebrations. Um, for the black governor celebrations, you would see parades, feasting, dancing, music throughout the day. And again, that's a really great, you know, um, way of perpetuating certain traditions that on a day-to-day -day basis, right, in many Connecticut communities, weren't being shared as actively just by nature of the societal structures at the time. I've also included on this screen, this is a page from the diary of a British soldier who was taken captive during the American Revolution. We've included this page because in this particular entry, he's been writing about how he's overhearing his captors, some you know, high standing white men in the community. He's been overhearing their fears about John Anderson, the black man who's just been recently elected to the position of black governor. Um, and he says, Christopher French in this diary, he says, the men in this community are worried that John Anderson has been trying to garner support for the British side. It turns out that those fears were unfounded. There was no proof that John Anderson was doing anything of the kind. But I love this little excerpt here because it does show us that, okay, the black governor maybe didn't have, you know, the same political power for lawmaking abilities, right, connections to the king as the colonial governor, but he definitely could rally together a group of people, right? He held that sway, he had that influence, and sometimes that did result in fear um, from other white members of the community. Um, so definitely, you know, something that's really telling, I think, about how Connecticut was at the time. So now we're gonna get into some specific people. Again, not deep dives into their lives, but kind of an overview of, of some significant people in early Connecticut. Our next four individuals all have some connection to Talcott Street Church. This was the first black church founded in Hartford, Connecticut. I believe it opened in, um, I think it was 1819. I could have the date a little off there. Um, but it was, of course, a religious you know, community organization, but also a center of education, philanthropy, philanthropy, they did a lot of community service, a lot of fundraising, um, so it was really this community hub. James Mars here, um, as you can see by his dates, right, was born long before this church began, but he ends up becoming a deacon at the church later on in his life. You also see on the screen um, the title page of James Mars's biography, or autobiography, essentially, and this one does happen to be a slave narrative, so of that specific genre. James Mars writes and records his life story toward the end of his life for a very specific reason. So you can see he passes in the 1880. Um, when he's in you know, his later years, he actually gets people approaching him, um, talking you know, about current events, certainly, especially as the Civil War is coming to a close. And the comment that he often gets is people here in Connecticut saying, oh, well, things were never that bad here, right? Things were never that bad. We didn't have slavery to the same extent. Some people even denied that slavery happened at all. And James Mars, you know, not unusual comments, we hear these even today, right? But for James Mars, 
slavery very much happened in his lifetime. Slavery very much affected him. You know, he was born into slavery. And so in the preface of his memoir, he writes, you know, basically a rebuttal to this, right? He's saying, okay, you know, I'm getting on in years. I didn't think I really wanted to record my story necessarily, but I kind of feel that it's necessary because I need to teach the people of Connecticut that this isn't even long ago history. Again, Connecticut didn't abolish slavery until 1848. So that is very close to, you know, when he's actually publishing this book. It's only about two decades after. So he tells his life story here. Um, some of that does include his period as an enslaved man. Because he was born after that Gradual Emancipation Act, James Mars had, you know, every um, expectation of being freed in his early 20s. And yet, as he got closer and closer to that birth date, he kind of caught on that his enslaver had plans to try to take him out of Connecticut and keep him enslaved. So he ran away, separated from his family briefly until he was you know, certain that he could enforce his legal freedom. Um, and after that point in his life, he kind of tried to do the same for other people. Um, so he backed this woman named Nancy Jackson in a court case here in Connecticut because her enslaver was also attempting to take her out of the state down to Georgia. Um, so he really does become kind of that voice, right? Using his own experience, using his own legal knowledge too, um, to really help others uh, be empowered to really seize their freedom and that case. And of course, this even action of writing this book is another real, you know, big action of um, making sure that that knowledge is spread. Our next man was not born here in Connecticut, but he does end up becoming um, minister of Talcott Street Church when he makes his way to Connecticut. So James Pennington was born into slavery down in Maryland. Um, he ran away a few times as a teenager. And throughout his you know, period of kind of um, attempting to escape to freedom, attempting to gain kind of um, a new life for himself, he is all the while seeking out all sorts of opportunities. So for example, he became a trained blacksmith early on in his life. He taught himself how to read and write because when he was you know, enslaved, that was something that was not accessible to him. <coughs> He then went further and taught himself how to read and write in both Greek and Latin. Um, so he's you know, always um, acquiring more knowledge and then becomes the first black man to attend Yale. So he's setting all of these you know, really high expectations for himself and he's meeting everyone. He becomes a minister of Talcott Street Church and is a great leader and orator. So he wrote you know, textbooks. Um, for the church school that later become more widely spread. He funds or heads up a fundraiser for the Amistad captive, so that group of um, Africans from what is now Sierra Leone who were uh, unlawfully really enslaved and imprisoned upon arriving here in the United States. The church, through his efforts, are raising funds to pay for their legal fees and then later for their ship back to Sierra Leone when they are finally freed under United States law. Um, and it's actually said today, kind of a cool connection across history, that James Pennington's writings, you know, in the mid 1800s, um, actually inspired Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. about a century later in many of his writings and speeches. Um, so again, those connections over time, right? We see similar battles being fought. We see similar even ideologies and language being used across time through many different activists who wouldn't have even met. Our next person was not a um, kind of leader of the church, was not a religious you know, leader like a deacon or a minister, but did end up coming to work in Hartford at the church school. And this is a man named Augustus Washington. He had grown up in New Jersey, but makes his way to Hartford to work at this church school, but pretty quickly um, really dives into this bigger career. He becomes a daguerreotypist. So this is early photography, right, when Augustus Washington makes his way into this profession. This is relatively new technology, but he realizes he's good at this. And so very quickly, his studio becomes the highest in demand in Hartford. This is an advertisement for that studio, and I love this last um, kind of section down here where it's appealing directly to ladies. You know, he's reaching out and saying, ladies, we've got our own, our own separate dressing room, right? If you need to kind of have an outfit change in between sittings, we've got all these different draperies to choose from, we will have you looking your best. So clearly he knows how to market, right? He's not only good at the technical side of things, but he's also good at getting that audience in. In our collection, we have a lot of um, daguerreotypes done by Augustus Washington that are kind of of this ilk, right? So wealthy Hartford so socialites basically wanting either their portraits taken, their daughter's portrait taken, family portraits taken. Um, so that's really, you know, his clientele. We're the Hartford elite of the time. This one is not from our collection. You can see we've credited it here, uh, but we thought it was really important to include in this presentation because this is abolitionist John Brown, who was born in Torrington, Connecticut, so 
nice local connection. Um, but also John Brown um, very kind of famously specifically asked Augustus Washington to take this image of him, this likeness. You know, he is very much re reaching out to another Connecticut and um, another abolitionist, a black abolitionist in this case, to have that portrait taken. Now, Augustus Washington, you know, is achieving a lot of success with this business in Hartford, and yet he becomes one of thousands, hundreds of thousands, of black Americans to actually leave the country and go settle in Liberia. So he and his family, in the midst of this, you know, seemingly great career, do uproot themselves and go across the ocean to an entirely new country to start anew. And this was a rather controversial decision at the time, not just for Augustus Washington, the kind of whole idea of colonizing um, Liberia in general was controversial, um, and there were many arguments for or against, right? There are many people like the Washington family saying, you know, if we're not being granted equality, equal opportunities here in the United States, why should we stay, right? What's, what's here for us? Um, and Augustus Washington did become a Liberian congressman, so clearly, you know, there are things open to him there that wouldn't have been here. On the flip side, many abolitionists, both black and white, did say that this was making it easier for, you know, people who wanted to perpetuate racist kind of um, just buildings of society, right, um, here in the United States, that if mass, you know, people, numbers of people were leaving, um, that's not going to, you know, force people to make change here in the United States. So again, kind of a controversial decision, but Augustus Washington ultimately did what he felt was best for his family. And again, he wasn't alone in doing so. There were about 300,000 black Americans that did decide to leave around this time period. Our last family connected with Talcott Street Church um, is the Primus family. Um, they were just members of the church, not working there th uh, in, you know, us outside from any kind of um, community service, contributing to fundraisers, that sort of thing. Um, but they were a member of kind of this smallish neighborhood in Hartford that at this time, so early to mid 1800s, had a higher literacy rate and employment rate under the black population than the white population. So I'm gonna focus in on Rebecca Primus, the daughter of this family. She grows up in this environment, right? Her family's very successful. Both of her parents are gainfully employed as a porter and a seamstress. Um, she attends school, she graduates high school, which was relatively rare in the 1800s for any person, young person in the United States, not just, you know, a black woman. Um, and she, you know, decides she's going to become a teacher. So that's exactly what she does after graduating high school. Now, one of her earliest posts is through the Hartford Freedmen's Aid Bureau, and she gets sent down to Virginia. This is like in the, I believe, 1860s, maybe even 1850s. Um, so it's, you know, right at this period where um, <laughs> People are starting to um, gain, you know, new path of freedom, and so she is experiencing a lot as a young teacher, right? She is having to educate people who um, have maybe had no access to education at all, right? All different ages, kind of all different stages in their life. She's also, though, experiencing a lot of cultural differences. Um, anyone who has ever traveled, right, Virginia's pretty different than Hartford, Connecticut. Um, so in terms of just, you know, how people were greeting each other on the streets, in terms of how people were worshiping at their local community churches, um, food, you know, music, all of that's going to be very eye-opening to Rebecca Primus, who up to this point in her life had pretty much been raised in that almost bubble of Hartford, right? Again, her community was very well off, you know, was very successful. Um, and this is something that actually Rebecca is almost able to continue to do throughout her life, learn from other people's perspectives. Um, she does end up coming back to the Northeast. She does end up kind of settling in Connecticut again, resuming teaching here. But she maintains throughout her life this correspondence with a young black woman named Addie Brown. Um, so they're about the same age. Rebecca's a little bit older than Addie. Um, but, you know, they don't have super similar experiences. Addie Brown is a working class woman through and through. She did not have the access to education that Rebecca had, um, and she meets the Primus family actually when she's um, working for them as a housekeeper. So she kind of bops around to different jobs. At one point, Addie is actually the assistant cook at Miss Porter School for Girls. She's a good seamstress, so she got takes in that from different families for a time. Um, but she writes, you know, and even tells Rebecca in person that um, her time working for the Primus family really got her thinking that's the level of, you know, comfort that she wanted to aspire to, that she's always working towards that, right? She saw through Rebecca's family that it's possible, and so she wants that for herself. 
Now, the letters, we have most of Addie's letters to Rebecca and then some other letters from the Primus family too. Um, the letters are amazing because they not only show this correspondence between these two young black women of different social classes and you know how they're kind of learning from one another, but it is also, at least in today's kind of society with our language today, it is also an example or could be read as an example of a queer relationship. Um, again, kind of tough to say because we're talking about a different time period, right? People didn't have kind of the same terms, vocabularies, but the way that they talk to each other, I'll give you kind of a paraphrased example. In one letter, Addie, you know, is writing to Rebecca, they've been kind of apart for a while, and she says, oh, Rebecca, how I miss, you know, having you around to kiss. Okay, you know, friends did that, that's not all that hard. But then she said, you know, if you was a man, I don't know what things would come to. So there's kind of this question of, you know, if things were different, if society was different, maybe the two of them could have pursued a romantic relationship. Given that this is all happening in the mid-1800s, especially given Addie Brown's position as that, you know, woman working for a living, they do both end up marrying men. Though they continue this correspondence and this very, very close relationship throughout the rest of their lives. Unfortunately, Addie's life is not particularly long, so she does achieve kind of an augmented level of comfort after her marriage, but she then succumbs to tuberculosis when she's about 28 years old. Um, so it's, yeah, not a very happy ending, but she lives on through, like I said, this amazing collection of letters that we have. I'm now going to, again, we're moving forward a little bit, right? So we're getting to, you can see his end date here, Charles Ethan Porter. We're getting closer to the 20th century. Um, and Charles Ethan Porter, in many ways, kind of paralleled Addie Brown's life. So he comes from a solidly working class family. Both his parents are employed, but they're working really to keep their family alive because he has, I believe it's something like nine or 10 siblings. So it's a very large family. Three of his uh, siblings pass away before Charles has graduated high school, and he graduates high school in, in 1865. One of those siblings of his um, did die in service in the Civil War, and he was a member of that 29th Regiment. So I guess that tiny connection there, but Charles Ethan Porter's brother did serve with many of the men that we just learned about. Um, Charles Ethan Porter, after graduating high school, he went to school in Rockville, Connecticut. Um, he decides that he's going to get two jobs so that he can just save up money because he wants to become an artist and he wants to go to art school. So he works at a mill and he works in, um, I think, out in tobacco fields, right, on a farm. And he's saving up this money and eventually earns enough um, and then gets in to the New York School of Design. So he's the first African American man to be admitted um, and, you know, he does end up succeeding, becoming an artist. Charles Ethan Porter here becomes a master of the American still life. And this is the one that we have in our collection here. Um, he's doing quite well for himself. He has a studio in New York City after finishing art school, but he also sets up a studio in Hartford, Connecticut. And that's where he ends up spending most of his time in kind of the late 1800s, in part because he's having some health concerns, he's closer to his family that way, but also in part because he's getting, you know, a good patronage there. Um, families like Mark Twain's family, Elizabeth Colt's family, the Cheney brothers, all buy works from Charles Ethan Porter here. And through this support, he's also able to get some letters of introduction to um, artists and studios over in France. So he does go abroad to continue studying for some time. Charles Ethan Porter, though, experiences this rapid decline in popularity around the turn of the 20th century. Um, this is when there becomes this kind of marked increase in attention paid towards Impressionism, right? This is kind of this new study, this new art form, newish. And he doesn't want to branch out into that, right? He kind of dabbles a little bit, but this is what he enjoys, you know, this is what he's good at. And so he kind of refuses to go a different way just because it's popular. <coughs> Unfortunately, that does mean he's not gonna be in as high demand. And so when he passes away in 1923, Charles Ethan Porter here is kind of in relative obscurity. In the 1980s, he had this resurgence, as sometimes happens with artists. So our historians of kind of our time um, almost rediscovered him, right? There have been some kind of retrospectives of his work put on. Um, there are, you know, museums um, throughout our country that have some of his works. So I know the Met has a few of his works. There are some university galleries on the West Coast that have done exhibits on him recently. So it's nice to see, right, that he's kind of building that fame once again. Now we have a family that, um, we have a lot of documentation on in our museum. So another kind of just insight to collecting, right? If we go back to someone like Charles Ethan Porter, um, we know a lot about his life, right? But our historical society only has one of his paintings, right? So it's, you know, not as in-depth a look, not as, you know, expansive as a collection as we might like. 
um, but that comes from you know trying to represent all bits and pieces of the state. With the Carrington family here, we've got scrapbooks of their family, so multiple books that contain photos, but also like handwritten captions, which I love. We've got letters by them. We've got some kind of like journal, diary entries, newspaper clips that talk about this family. So they might not be famous in the same way that some of the other people I've talked about are, but they you know, offer us kind of a broader view of their lives, which is just so cool when you're a history nerd like me. So the Carrington family, we've got Manzella and her husband Alexander, um, both having grown up in the South and making their way north to live in Connecticut, Norwich, um, right kind of around the time they got married. Um, so this is where they're working and raising their family and where their children grow up. They end up having two kids. You see them pictured over here. That's Nanette and Alexander Jr. Um, this is Manzella's mother, Eliza. Just a little side note here. This is, to me, one of the best photos in this whole kind of collection because I just relate to it so much. I mean, any of you out there, can you think of a time when your parents, you know, as a young child, dressed you up, sat you down, said, we're getting this photo with grandma, right? You better behave, we're gonna have one nice photo. That's what I imagine is happening here, right? And it is, it worked out, it's nice. They're with grandma, they're with mom, you see the two little kids. Um, both Manzella and Alexander Sr. worked as pups. Um, we have some kind of cool little um, snippets from society pages, you know, picnics that they essentially catered, you know, so early catering business there. And then we have these day-to-day -day snapshots, right? Them, you know, in their car, accompanied by a little note saying, oh yeah, we drove to the beach as a family today, you know, it was excellent. Because, you know, we have all this documentation, we actually get to see the children, Nanette and um, Alex Jr. here, as little kids, but then we have basically what would be like their senior portraits in high school today. Um, we know that after graduating high school, um, Alexander Jr. did go on to college, so he attended what was the Agricultural College at the time, now UConn, mm -hmm. and then that became a hairdresser. We also know that they both lived pretty long lives. Alexander, for instance, was 104 years old when he died. Um, and that's pretty, yeah, to be quite that old, but I think she was in her 90s. So they saw a lot, and the timing is important here. Both of those um, children, that adults are living through kind of the um, turn of the century and then well into the 20th century. So they're certainly seeing a lot of change, a lot of transition in terms of how Connecticut's population is shifting and changing. A lot of that is due to the Great Migration. So in the early 20th century, right, we see this mass influx of all sorts of um, black families, you know, coming to urban centers in the north. So that includes Hartford, even though I know Hartford is kind of small compared to a lot of urban centers in the north here, but it does include you know, areas in Connecticut. And it really changes Connecticut culturally, right? Think of any new group of people, whether it's coming from the same country, we see this with immigrant groups coming in today too, right? They're going to bring you know, important parts of their lives with them. So that means that there would be you know, new community centers popping up. There would be new worship centers, certainly, and to both black and white northerners alike, the kind of Baptist traditions were a little bit unfamiliar and maybe felt, you know, a little bit um, exuberant at times, but it's something that would be here to stay, you know, once you have this influx of southerners. Um, this time, too, because the increase in the black population is so great, so it almost kind of doubles in the first three decades of the 20th century here in Connecticut, that black population. Because of this, um, the first two chapters of the NAACP in Connecticut are formed. So there's one formed down in New Haven, one formed in Hartford. That's both happening, I believe it's in 1907 and 1909. So we see, you know, some very positive change occurring because of the Great Migration. There are, of course, going to be difficulties as well, right? There are going to be culture clash. There are going to be racial clashes. There's going to be, you know, not maybe as overt discrimination, but there's certainly going to be discriminatory practices in Connecticut that these communities are going to start having to work through a little bit more because it's now being, um, you know, pushed. There's a lot more pushback um, as you have, you know, community groups and organizations coming to, to really bring people together. So with the Great Migration, Connecticut does see, you know, a lot more people coming up north, and so we get some, you know, very noteworthy transplants ending up here, one being Miss Freddie Washington. Um, Freddie Washington was born in the Savannah, Georgia area, and she moves north not to pursue, you know, a career in or a job, get a job in, you know, industry, manufacturing, agriculture, as so many workers did, but in the entertainment business. 
She first um, spends a lot of time in New York City, kind of the Harlem area. Um, her first job is sort of as a cabaret dancer. She joins a dance troupe called the Happy Honeysuckles that had connections to Josephine Baker. Freddie Washington, early in her career, is great at making connections. So she's got that Josephine Baker connection, and then her first film, Black and Tan, featured the orchestra of Duke Ellington. So again, right, she's, she knows how to get her hands there and build upon them. What really catapults Freddie Washington to fame is this role of Piola in the film Imitation of Life. Uh, Piola is a character, I see people are familiar with this, right? So Piola is a character who passes as white because of her light skin. And this is something that Freddie Washington actually had to kind of contend with for the rest of her career because people would bring it up in interviews or maybe even fans kind of to her face, right? They would say to her, oh yeah, so you must, you must have done that too, right? Or you must do that, you must kind of use passing as kind of a way through communities. And Freddie Washington got rather offended by this, right? She was very proud of being a black actress, a successful mm. black actress, and didn't want people to think she was hiding or trying to push aside that whole big part of her you know, person. Um, I think she, you know, through her efforts, even more than kind of her rebuttals to those statements, really showed her pride in her craft. She, for instance, became a founding member of the Negro Actors Guild. You see her kind of business card there. She also, as she became more and more established in the business, um, kind of raised money, set up funds to help young black entertainers, um, particularly in the, the kind of area of housing. She discovered, you know, very quickly through experience that white entertainers might be offered housing in certain areas or might be offered housing at all, but she wasn't given those same opportunities. So she tries to help that and tries to kind of act as that mentor and that provider for a lot of young other black actors. She ends up spending the last 40 years of her life um, living in Greenwich, Connecticut. Um, her husband, you see him up there, um, is a Stanford-based dentist. So they're settling here in Hartford. She's still close enough to New York City that she can you know, go back and forth. But she's very much you know, being this Connecticut girl at the end of her life here. Um, and she was inducted into you know, Halls of Fame as, a, as an adult um, for both her acting craft, but also some of the directing that she did. Kind of a nice parallel to Freddie Washington is Ann Petrie here. Um, Ann Petrie and Freddie Washington are living in, in Connecticut, you know, working around the same time. But Ann Petrie lived in Connecticut for most of her life. So she grew up in Old Saybrook, down by the shore. Um, she does spend some time in New York City as well, but she ends up moving back to Connecticut to live out most of her life. Um, so Ann Petrie here. Um, she is, you know, a, a, a renowned black author here. She's the first black woman to sell over a million copies of a book. It's the one we have highlighted on the screen here, The Street. Um, and this is one that draws on her experiences in New York City. It's not an autobiographical book per se, but it is about a young black mother who is single, who is unemployed, working for employment, trying to you know, um, combat you know, poverty, sexual harassment, all sorts of challenges. Um, so she's definitely you know, drawing from her time in the city. She later, especially after moving back to Connecticut, kind of writes similar themed books, but setting them set place in kind of more rural New England, right, Queen New England towns, but always kind of dealing with that, those themes of you know, inequality, of discrimination. And when asked about it, Anne Petrie actually said that she didn't learn about discrimination, right, about inequality um, from time spent in, say, Mississippi or Alabama, she learned about it growing up in Connecticut as a young girl. So she cites this story of when her Sunday school went to the beach. You know, she was the only little black girl in that group, and other beachgoers started kind of protesting her presence on that beach. This is when she's about seven years old, right? And the lifeguard of the kind of beach, I guess, ranger, eventually tells that Sunday group they have to leave because Aunt Petri is black and there aren't any black people on this beach. So clearly that experience stuck with her. Clearly, you know, this is something that she too, kind of like James Mars all those years earlier, right, are going to make sure they're sharing with their readers, right? Saying, you know, people might think things are okay here. That's actually not the case. Open your eyes a little bit more. We have in our collection, in addition to books and letters, this writing desk <coughs> of Anne Petrie. So her daughter actually donated this rather large collection um, to the Connecticut Historical Society, which included things owned by you know, author Anne here, but also by the broader family and some of their acquaintances. 
So Anne Petrie, before she became a writer, actually kind of assumed she was going to be a pharmacist because both her dad and her aunt were pharmacists and she attended pharmacy school for a bit, but decided it was not for her. I mention this because if you go to Old St. Brook today, the James Pharmacy owned by her aunt does still exist. It's not quite the same form it was anymore. They now serve gelato, for instance. They <laughs> <laughs> do a really great job of building on that history. They have signage up throughout. They have, you know, some things from the family. Um, so it's definitely, you know, kind of this little historic land tomorrow um, because it's changed a bit. Uh, they also had a really close family friend who we'll talk about at the very end of our presentation because some of her objects were also donated by Liz Petrie. And they come to Johnny Taylor. So again, right now we're firmly in the 20th century. Johnny Taylor here is another beloved Hartford figure um, because of his, his athletic prowess. So he actually excelled starting off in high school baseball. He went to Bolkley High School and set all kinds of records as a pitcher and batter, which you know today it's rather unusual to be successful in both those areas, but he certainly was. So much so that he's getting scouted when he's in high school um, until the scouts realize he's black and then some of them stop pursuing him. Because the MLB was not um, you know, integrated at that point, there was actually one scout, I believe it was um, a New York scout, who tried to convince Johnny Taylor here to change his last name and pretend that he was Cuban. So again, we see parallels to people's stories, right? It's kind of like Freddie Washington here. And Johnny Taylor, much like Freddie Washington, says, no, why would I do that? That's not who I am. <laughs> Even amidst all of that, Johnny Taylor is able to succeed, right? There are a lot of leagues outside of the MLB at this point um, that were integrated. So he plays in the Negro League, but also in the Mexican League, in the Cuban League, um, which would have admitted players of all you know, different races and backgrounds. He does play, too, for a semi-professional team called the Hartford Savage Gems. That's the uniform you see for years. Um, and after he retires, he stays in Hartford. So he really was you know, this local man. He got married, had four kids, joined construction teams. Um, and when Hartford was kind of symbolically integrating one of their other baseball teams a few decades after he had retired, he comes out of retirement for a day to kind of help them through that process, right? Again, showing just how you know, important and you know, famous a figure he was to Hartford baseball fans and really the Hartford community at that time. Um, the Hartford Yard Goats do have a day each summer where they celebrate him. I forget what date that is, but it's probably this month, so it's kind of a cool connection, right? This history being present even in our kind of seemingly non-connected things like the Yard Goats. So now we're moving closer and closer to the present, you know, and when you're talking about black history in any place in the United States, of course the civil rights movement of the mid 20th century is going to be, you know, a major time period to talk about. Um, and we certainly had, you know, a number of activists who are active here in Connecticut. I'm going to focus on William J. Brown here. Um, I will note that we had a um, kind of small exhibit on Connecticut freedom workers back in 2021. So it's not up anymore, but it was digitized. So if you want to know more about William Brown or any of kind of the other people working in Connecticut at this time, student groups, community groups, church groups, um, that is on our website. So you can kind of walk through the exhibit in digital form. So William Brown here um, actually you know, served in a number of places throughout his lifetime. He um, worked for universities out in the Midwest. He helped establish um, chapters of the Urban League in many different cities, including the Urban League of Greater Hartford. Um, so he, you know, here in Hartford, is really a community leader. There's no better way to describe him because he was always kind of looking for ways to provide opportunities for those who, you know, lacked them, whether it was because they were, you know, of a lower social class, whether it was because of their race. Um, he also, you know, of course, and you see his shoes here, he also did participate in some of the big, you know, non-Connecticut only events like the 1963 March in Washington for jobs and for time. You know, he is very much traveling, making his presence known. And he's also, you know, gathering groups of people from Connecticut to travel to the places that are having these marches and protests. In addition to his shoes, we were recently um, given, in part of his papers and, you know, things, collection, um, his traveling bar. So it looks like, you know, a little mini suitcase, and when you open it, there are all little shot glasses, <laughs> and mixing tools, which is such a fun object, and it can be read on a few different 
different levels, right? It's so interesting because you're like, oh, how practical, right? You can always have, you know, your favorite drink on hand, but then it also reminds us of the realities of John Brown or William J. Brown's situation, right? That he, when traveling, would not have always been allowed into hotel bars, into restaurants. When he's going down south, right, he has to have his traveling bar if he wants to drink at all. And I'm sure he's going to want to drink, you know, after days and days of travel and protest and just, you know, organizing. Even after he retired, um, Brown did work as sort of a liaison between different groups. So he was on the board, he acted as consultants to everything from local rotary clubs to YMCAs to, you know, kind of smaller chapters of the NAACP. So really, you know, this leader in terms of pushing equality in Connecticut. We also recently acquired, so you'll see, right, we have this kind of being a theme that we're trying to be active um, in collecting you know, more diverse documents and objects more recently. So we acquired this set of Black Panther newspapers, I believe in 2018. I have yet to read through all of them, but um, I will say, you know, you get the big headlines on the pages, which, you know, is maybe more of the, the stuff that would have been seen nationally, right, this particular trial, or this particular set is talking about the, the trials that surrounded um, the New Haven Nine, you know, and how they were um, being charged with the murder of a, a fellow um, Black Panther, Alex Rackley. Um, so this certainly made national news, right? These trials were happening down um, in New Haven, so Yale students got involved as well as local, you know, community members. And the trials really um, kind of unveiled unsavory activity on behalf of the FBI and the Black Panthers, so it was uh, very incendiary. Um, the newspapers talk about big events like that, as you can see from these kind of headline pages. But what's also really cool is that they talk about some of the smaller projects that aren't always you know, as celebrated or as lauded the Black Panthers participated in, right? So like providing lunches for community members, right? Um, there are stories of incarcerated members, you know, kind of talking about their experiences. So things that kind of haven't made the headlines as much or haven't made history textbooks, maybe I should say, as much. Um, so a really cool, you know, experience to kind of um, maybe give a little more nuance to this group in history that often isn't afforded that kind of um, analysis. 